be here for the, the third session in this series of six. Um, so I'm Elizabeth, as Jill said, I'm um, a uh, portfolio holder for climate change at Mid-Devon District Council. Um, when I'm not doing that, I do various other things. I've um, developed a community development charity. We work around the world um, and I'm a writer and various other things, bit of a jack of all trades really. Um, and yeah, I'm looking forward to this discussion. So we'll be looking today at um, community wealth building and the climate emergency um, and thinking about how we might help local authorities in responding to uh, the climate and ecological emergencies. We'll explore the role of community partners um, in creating broader social value um, and other things. Um, so Jill's briefly touched on, but for those of you who don't know, New Prosperity Devon was set up um, to support an economic development for Devon, which values the kind of the future um, as well as current prosperity um, and which values well-being and economic security for everybody um, and which also provides um, a thriving natural environment, soil, um, biodiversity, um, developing resilience um, and so on. Um, and one of the ways that NPD approaches these things is through the lens of community wealth building. Um, I won't go into loads of detail here. Um, there's lots of resources online, but briefly, community wealth building is a people centered approach to local economic development. Um, and the idea is um, that it redirects wealth back into the local community, into the local economy um, and, and, and places control and benefits into the hands of local people. Um, and it's one response to um, contemporary and complex challenges um, and it seeks to provide resilience, uh, local economic security, and it can include things like progressive procurement of goods and services, um, shared ownership models, fair employment um, and generating social value from land and other assets. And then thinking briefly about the climate emergency, so around three quarters, I believe, of local authorities have declared a climate emergency uh, and are taking action to reduce their own emissions, um, as well as working with partners and local communities to, um, to do this. And my own, um, well not my council, but the council on which I sit, Mid Devon, um, is one of those authorities that's declared an emergency. We've been working on creating our own um, action plan and more broadly a kind of strategy for um, for achieving our goal of being net zero carbon emissions by 2030. Um, we currently don't have any dedicated climate staff um, but we are just about to recruit um, a, a dedicated climate and sustainability um, officer at the council which is great. There's lots of work that they'll be picking up and running with hopefully so that's exciting um yeah and just speaking briefly from my own perspective as a portfolio holder before i introduce our speakers today um from my point of view it's really clear that that this work will require um amongst other things meaningful um and deep collaboration um and strengths and knowledge sharing um as well as funding of course um it shouldn't be seen as a separate piece of work that perhaps is a burden, but rather a lens through which to join dots between council departments, for example, um, and a lens through which to make good decisions for people and place now and in the future. Um, I think there are some real opportunities here um, that I'm enjoying exploring around deeper community engagement. You know, this is something that mid Devon has been um, looking to do and actually I think that um, the climate emergency is a great way of, of show, you know showing what that uh, good community engagement looks like and what it can achieve um, and it can also create benefits beyond just carbon reduction so improved well-being energy um, and income generation as well perhaps um, and, and other things so, so it's clear to me that all of this work requires collaboration partnerships engagement and really informed decision making. Um, so I'm really pleased to introduce our two speakers um, who will help us to dive a bit deeper into uh, these approaches and to help us sort of join the dots between community wealth building and the climate emergency. 
So first up, we've got um, Andrew Shadrake, who is from Action on Climate in Teambridge, which is a community-led CIC that supports the district council there um, to make uh, the district carbon neutral, uh, sustainable, resilient, and healthy. He also works with local Spark Tor Bay um, and specializes in local economic regeneration um, and many other things. And we've also then got Peter Lefort, um, who is the sector and partnerships lead at Cornwall Council. Um, and Cornwall's new partnership group is sort of aiming to find new ways for Cornwall to address the climate emergency um, as part of carbon neutral Cornwall. So uh, yeah, so first up we'll have Andrew. Um, and then what I suggest is after Andrew's done his um, uh, presentation, we'll briefly see if there's any kind of clarifying questions that people have and then go straight into Peter's talk. And then after Peter's talk, we'll go into a deeper Q&A um, and yeah, see what comes up and have a um, fruitful conversation. Um, so that's plenty from me. Um, I'd like to now hand over to Andrew. Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth. And it's great to be here and to see everybody. Um, so, I, uh, as, as I was introduced, I do work with Local Spark as an uh, associate. They are an organization that supports social enterprise development in Torbay. And I'm also, as Elizabeth said, one of the founders of ACT, Action on Climate in Teambridge. And the rest of the time, I work to help people to start social enterprises, getting the legal structures right, and also getting their finances right. And what I wanted to talk about uh, today, really, was uh, partnerships, council and community partnerships. And um, it's a way really of bringing together some of the different things that were mentioned earlier on. So if I can get my screen to change when I want it to. I hope everyone can see that screen okay. I'm getting nods, so I shall go with the nods. Okay, there are four things that I wanted to address uh, this morning. And um, the first, is about community wealth. It's the link between community wealth as um, a jargon term that one or two people talk about. And what I like to think of community wealth as being something much more big, much bigger and something which impinges on all of us. And then to show how within that, council and community partnerships can uh, be a way forward to improving uh, the lives of people in our communities. And then give a couple of examples um, one of an existing partnership, Action on Climate in Teambridge, and then another of one that um, is a future truth. I believe that it should exist, and I'm going to try and put the case for it very briefly this morning and hope to encourage and enthuse people to uh, co-create it. So let's see how we go. Take about 15 minutes or so. So starting with that first one, community wealth writ large. People familiar with community wealth building as a concept will have come across screens like this. Please don't try and read it. I have enough trouble reading it myself and I'm supposed to be a specialist in this stuff. And it's all very good and it's all very true. And basically what it's saying is that councils can help their communities through partnerships, particularly with cooperatives and social enterprises to develop and regenerate. And it's fantastic stuff. And there's been a lot of discussion about procurement, for example, how councils can improve the procurement that they do. Well, and that's great if you're a larger council which buys lots of stuff, slightly less applicable usually to um, a town council uh, or a parish council. But nevertheless, it's, it's part of the picture. What I'd like to do though, is to look upon community wealth building as something wider. Sorry for the slightly saccharine colored slide here, but what I'm really trying to get across is the idea that actually we're looking at trying to create resilient local communities, resilient local economies and well-being for the people who live in them. And that's what I call, uh, well, it's another way of describing community wealth. And there are ways that we can do that, I think, uh, as well as take, bearing in mind the other key element of what we're talking about today, which is addressing climate change. 
a very wonky globe there, but uh, there we are. Uh, you, get the, you get the basic point. It seems to me that creating a resilient local, local economy requires responding to the climate emergency, because if we don't do that and get that right, we won't have a local economy. And so they're all part and parcel of the same kind of thing. So that's the context, the idea that community wealth building and climate emergency can, can come together as part of a bigger thing that we need to address to create local resilient economies. And the second point that I'm going to talk about is how that can be affected through council and community partnerships. And people have been talking about partnerships between councils and communities for a very long time. Um, and there are some very successful ones which we'll come on to, but they take many forms. I'd like to talk about why it is that we're interested in such partnerships. And one of the key reasons for local authorities, councils actually of any size, I'm very definitely including parish and town councils in this, is that councils have trust of local people. Now, when councillors are walking down the high street and dealing with people who are complaining about this or arguing about that, about wondering why they voted in a certain way on something else, they might feel that actually that trust is not really in the forefront of people's minds. And it may not be in the forefront of people's minds, but it's absolutely in the background. The basis of councils is that they are not going anywhere, they're part of the community they're in, they're elected and they're accountable. And people complain because they say, you are my elected and accountable representative and you're acting like X, Y, and Z. That doesn't work if you're talking to Amazon, if you're talking to a footloose industry that's come and planted a building down and extracted some profit and is leaving. I'm talking about Arcadia, um, I'm talking about so Philip Green, people that come in, asset strip, take profits and leave. We're talking about organizations that stay put. And so because they're trusted, it means there's an opportunity to co-create with them, to collaborate with them, because it's all bound, based in respect. And that means that you can create a partnership. Well, I did my best. Anyway, the idea is that you can create partnerships in local authorities to do different things. And I'd like to give you two examples. First of all, action on climate in Teambridge. Now here's an example of where you had a set of people in the community who got together a couple of years ago, we had a meeting and there were 200 people who came. And that meeting was caused by something that the local authority did. And since then, lots of local authorities have done it as well. And that is to declare a climate emergency. They haven't all done what Teambridge has done, which is to declare a climate emergency with an intention to reach net zero carbon emissions by 2025. But hey, we'll see how we go with that. Anyway, the community came together and said, council can't do it on its own. We need to support them. We need to work with them. And so um, to do that, uh, what it did was to form a community interest company. There's a very definite reason why it did this. It wanted to be the, the, the responsible and key partner for the local authority. And to, to do that, it had to exist. And it had to exist in a way that it could demonstrate was for community benefit, not for the individuals who were involved. And it was going to undertake various activities, so it needed to have a, a bank account. So it formed a community interest company. And once it had got that, once it was able to engage in discussions with the local authority, the local authority, Teambridge District Council, appointed it as the single point of contact on uh, trying to achieve that climate emergency zero carbon target between the council and the community. Not the, clearly the council has its own ways of reaching communities, but one thing that Action on Climate in Teambridge can do is to provide a conduit for what local people are thinking in different areas and giving that and helping the council to understand what that is. And doing the reverse, being another way in which the council can get its message out to local communities. And we've been 
working together in quite a lot of ways. Um, one of the ways that we were working together is by having regular uh, meetings. They were physical. They are now virtual Zoom meetings. I don't always wear the polka dot pants, but it has been known. Sorry, Jackie. Um, one of the people on the call is Jackie Hook, who's the portfolio holder for climate uh, and in, um, in Teambridge and one of the founders of Action on Climate in Teambridge and takes part in these calls. At least whether she'll still take part in them after this slide remains to be seen, but she has them up to now. And what we're able to do is to discuss how um, community organisations and ACT in particular can support the council and also get an understanding of what the council is doing on various issues. It's, it's been doing quite a lot. It's appointed a, uh, a climate change officer, specialist officer, and we've been working with the council, for example, looking at the local plan, because we have community expertise in certain areas. And we've able, been able to support the council, who's staffed like all councils with very overworked offices, to be able to um, put addressing the climate change issue at the heart, for example, of its review of its local plan. And in a wide range of other things which you can find out about on our website. But what I want to talk about now is two specific initiatives that Action on Climate and Team has undertaken. We've created a resources pack, a very full, but not actually very red, pack for town and parish councils. And it lays out um, why town and parish councils in Teambridge might want to declare a climate emergency. Um, if they do, what, what action they can take thereafter, because it's all very well declaring an emergency. But then people start turning around saying, OK, you've declared it, what are you actually going to do? So we've been trying to help councils to identify what they can do in a number of areas, transport, food, farming, forestry, and ecology, and the built environment, all these different things. So there's a whole set of resources. And those resources are, of course, available to councils from any area, not just in Teambridge, on the action uh, in, on Climate in Teambridge website. That's one thing we've done. Another thing we've done, just started, and which I love to bits, is the Wildlife Warden Scheme. We were on Spotlight, yes. And um, essentially what this scheme has is, uh, an intention to have volunteer wildlife wardens in each of our 45 parishes, between two and say five or half a dozen people uh, in, in each of those parishes. And we're off to a very good start. I think we've got 75 people lined up uh, and that's in 10 days who are, who are showing interest in, in being part of this scheme. And we will have a part-time paid coordinator. We've managed to get some funding from um, Dartmoor National Park Authority, from um, Jackie Hook's uh, community fund, which was very helpful, and from other sources as well, to be able to fund a part-time coordinator. And what those wardens will do when they've had training is to be able to work in habitat management and connecting up things like hedges and woodlands to create wildlife corridors, um, talking to farmers about farming and wildlife, uh, helping people to create wildlife gardens, um, and also, interestingly, monitoring planning applications and developments and uh, reporting to the council if, if, they, if they feel that there should be changes in those applications to take account of biodiversity. Now, the point here is that, yes, we've created this and it's community based, but the Wildlife Warden Scheme is going to keep in very close contact with the local authority, which has its own green spaces team. As I said, overworked, as all the council officers are, but wherever possible, we'll collaborate with that Green Spaces team. And we've got um, interest also from other organisations like Devon, the Devon Biodiversity Record Centre, which is very keen on the records that we can produce. So it's a successful action that's being taken, not in this case directly on climate, but on ecological. Um, addressing the ecological emergency, which has also been declared by Cambridge Council and other councils. Enough on that. The final area. This is my future truth, that we will have at least one local landholding trust in the next year. Maybe we'll have several. 
Now, a local land holding trust can address problems for towns and, and villages all around. This, I live in Bubby Tracy, this is Bubby Tracy's High Street. And um, like all high streets, it is facing a huge problem, isn't it? It was facing a huge problem before COVID came along. It's now facing a bigger one. Everyone, things are closing down. You don't need, need me to go through all the reasons that lead to the challenges and the likelihood that many shops will close. And so there's a couple of things that come out of this. One is that very often there are organizations in communities that are keen to do something. Perhaps they want to start a social enterprise and operate in a shop. Perhaps they want to be able to buy a building that comes up for sale. A lot of these buildings will come up for sale. And people might think, hey, that's a perfect position for doing something in our town. But if a business or a social enterprise wants to start um, from scratch, perhaps a social enterprise that's come out of the last six months where it's maybe had a food distribution scheme that it wants to sustain in the future, then not only does it have to be, have to be an expert in the business it's going to start, it also often has to be an expert in how you buy a building. And that, it has to be said, is a steep and additional learning curve. And I think it's an unnecessary learning curve. I think there's a much better way of doing these things. I'm talking about creating local land holding trusts. For example, you could have a number of councils. Those are the logos of Bubby Town Council, unsurprisingly, but fastly, being very clear about what it is and how wonderful it is, and Ashburton Town Council on the left. Those three councils alone could form a partnership. They could work with communities represented by my figures at the bottom here to create a community benefit society. And that community benefit society could be capitalized from um, borrowings by those councils, but also from a share issue. So community, people in communities can invest. And when properties come up for sale, as they so often do, then the local land holding trust, which would be an expert on buying money property, could bid for it and could buy it. And then it could, aha, my time is up. Uh, and then uh, it could let it to that social enterprise or eventually sell it to that social enterprise. This is a way of helping communities to develop much more effectively, uh, quickly, by taking out this additional hurdle that they face. And so that's my final slide at the moment, suggesting that there's a way that something new that local authorities can do in partnership with their communities, which can actually kickstart local economic regeneration. And that is me. Thank you very much. Brilliant. That's great. Thanks very much, Andrew. I'm going to just pause briefly before we move on just to check whether anybody has um, a question that is about kind of clarifying something. Um, so anything you didn't understand or just wanted a bit of it? extra information on um, that would help this session um, as we move forward. Um, you can either just unmute yourself and ask your question or use the raise hand function. So I can see Pauline's hand is up um, and then is it John McKay? Yes, yeah. Great, so Pauline first and then John. I just wanted to ask if there are any examples of um, these land holding trusts, whether any are already in existence at all anywhere in the country or globally? Um, in the way that I'm describing it, I don't know of one. However, the mechanism is very well used. Uh, there's an example uh, of a community, entirely community-based one in Plymouth called Nudge. Nudge is a community benefit society which bought the clipper which was a closed pub uh, through a share issue, but also with significant support from the council, from Plymouth City Council. Um, and uh, what's interesting about that example is they started with a pub in Union Street. And since then they've managed to acquire 
another site, the plot further up, a closed warehouse on the other side. Um, recently, they've taken over control of what used to be the Gaumont Picture House. And so they're redeveloping one of the most deprived streets in Plymouth over time. So they're proving the model. It's simply that it was one which actually was started by two people who used to work for Plymouth Council and moved out to work on their own, rather than being something that was led by the local authority. Either model, model works, but um, in legal and financial terms, this model stacks up. It's been proven. Oh, uh, one final thing, works in rural areas too. There is the ecological um, land cooperative, for example, which buys or is bequeathed land and then offers it to young farmers who want to start up. Similar model, rural areas can work really well. Brilliant. Thanks, Andrew. Um, John, you had a question. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi, Andrew. Uh, that was a really interesting talk. Um, uh, uh, a couple of things. Um, the, a lot of what you said um, uh, is very interesting, but I, uh, I'm not sure the the land trust thing. How does that differ from you know community land trusts? that are often set up uh, for to build uh, affordable social housing mixes. Uh, there's that aspect of it. There's um, the power to change produced a paper. I think it was last year about. Um, uh, I've got it here. I can't remember the title of it. About uh, uh, take back the high street, and it was it, basically it was. Um, uh, putting forward the what what you're suggesting in terms of community ownership partnerships with the local authorities uh, uh, and it, it does look like a, a very uh, interesting model and there does uh, uh, and I think there is a lot of interest in this uh, clearly I mean power to change have written a paper on it so there is there is real interest in this um, in terms of working with the um, local authority one of the, the the things that our local authority has is a service level agreement whenever it's dealing with people outside which i think gets in the way of of, of a proper partnership I'd, I'd be interested in your view on 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 how how that develops and how that works when you're you've set up a, a, a cic and uh, are you subject to service level agreements and this sort of, uh, is that the, the nature of the relationship with the local authority? Okay, um, to take the last one first, no, it's not the nature of the, the relationship between um, action on climate in Teambridge and uh, the local authority. In fact, what we have is uh, an arm's length partnership. We're not under contract to the local authority. The local authority does, doesn't pay us any money. Um, and we've made a conscious decision not to go down that route, um, largely for the reason that I think underlies your question about it, that we, we need to maintain uh, separation. Now, there's an argument that it would have been light, slightly easier for us if we had, because uh, uh, this is not confined to Teambridge. In, in all local authorities, it's sometimes easier for officers to work with and value the input from a paid consultant than from an unpaid volunteer. And if we'd had a contractual relationship, we would have overcome that. But we felt that actually the important thing was to demonstrate our professional skills and expertise without entering into that relationship. So there is no grant funding uh, uh, from the, uh, the council to the CIC? There has been... Or if there is, there are no strings attached to it but, uh, in terms of service level agreements or any other. Uh, Jackie will correct me. I don't think we've had any, any funding from the local authority as such. What we have had is funding from uh, quite a lot of council officers from their community pots. And that's been right. clearly the, an endorsement. Um, and that's, that's tied to doing specific things, yes. But um, it might be, for example, the Wildlife Warden Scheme. Um, coming back to the first question, um, the difference between creating a community land trust or doing what was done in Union Street and what I'm suggesting is essentially one of timing. I think that what's needed is to create a, an overarching, a sort of umbrella uh, community land trust or local land holding trust, which has its capital ready to go, has its partnerships and its expertise ready to go. So that when a property comes on the market and it's appropriate for uh, it to be taken into community use, then that trust is able to bid 
at auction because it's already got its money in the bank, which and very often what happens is, and you probably know this perfectly well, community groups see that uh, a building is about to be sold, uh, picking one at random, the Methodist Church Hall in Ashburton, and they have to really rush around trying desperately to raise the money to win at auction. Yeah. In that instance, they were lucky, but it would be much, much better if they didn't have to do that and they could do what that group actually wanted to do, which was uh, once the property was available, turn it into an arts venue. That's where their expertise lies. So it's a question of having the money ready uh, to go ahead and do it. And local authorities do have access to some capital, obviously, and but communities can also rate, uh, invest through a share issue. Brilliant. Thank okay, you thanks. very much. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I'm going to now move on and introduce Peter. Um, so if anyone else has questions that you'd like to ask either Andrew or Peter um, after his presentation, then you can type them in the chat box or hold on to them and we'll um, again open up a chance to uh, share your questions afterwards. Um, but now over to Peter, who's the Sector and Partnerships Lead at Cornwall Council. Brilliant, thank you very much. And uh, hi everyone. Um, so bear with me, share my slides. So um, I'm going to talk about um, Cornwall Council's approach to the climate emergency and uh, and how it's adapted donor economics and the uh, the overlap there with uh, with community wealth building. Um, so a bit of context, um, obviously I'm sure everyone's familiar with the, the concept of the, of the climate emergency and, and communicating that within Cornwall. Um, there are a number of existing and tangible risks uh, that we can point to as things that are likely to be exacerbated uh, in the coming years uh, that are already problems now um, around uh, our high levels of deprivation, our, our, our vulnerability on our coasts and our vulnerability of our supply chains as well. Um, so ex the exploration of this culminated in, in our declaration of a climate emergency in January last year um, and working towards the target of carbon neutral by 2030, which is 20 years ahead of national government's uh, 2050 target. Uh, and the, uh, the reason being because of the, the urgency that we face. Uh, and, and I think in Cornwall being able to uh, visibly see uh, the impacts um, already, already taking place, um, not least the ones happening around the world. So to kind of explore how we, how we look at that, um, I'm not going to go into the, the theory of donor economics too much because I think you know, it's, it's much better said elsewhere. Um, but just um, in case you're not familiar with it, um, I guess all you need to know is so this was developed by um, uh, Kate Rayworth. Uh, he used to work for uh, Oxfam, is now at uh, Oxford University. Um, and this is a model that is um, essentially a counterpoint to linear economic growth. Uh, where you, know, you put resources in and you get waste out and you just continue forever. Um, and uh, you know, people are realizing um, what many people have been saying for, for a very long time that that simply doesn't work. Um, and this is an attempt to, uh, to offer a balance to that. So how Donut Economics works in, in, in very short uh, um, time, we have the, the, the social foundation and the um, environmental ceiling or the boundaries. Uh, and we could um, put our resources into meeting the needs of society uh, entirely. But if we do that alone, we run the risk of overshooting our planetary boundaries. But if we go the other way and just focus on uh, looking after the planet, then we run the risk of uh, increasing inequality um, and not leaving people in a place where they could thrive. So the principle here is there is this sweet spot in the middle, the donut, this green circle, where we are balancing both the social needs and the uh, environmental planetary needs. Um, so that's the principle here, is a way of kind of looking at the bigger picture and looking at a complex system. Um, and this is one of the ways in which I think it's, it's very relevant to the idea of community wealth building and as a way that Cornwall Council has been able to engage in this idea. So to, to kind of put it in a, in, um, in a different frame, uh, this is often how I uh, uh, find it useful to, to explain this um, within and, uh, and without Cornwall. Um, is uh, looking at the idea of, of, of complicated and complex systems. So the bicycle here represents a complicated system. It's, uh, it's, it's not easy to understand, but you can understand it. You can take it apart, uh, you can put it back together, you can predict what's gonna happen if you move a certain thing. And if you've got enough expertise, then you can, you can use this system. 
On the other hand, we've got uh, represented by a cyclist, a complex system. So there are parts of it that are understandable, but it's more, it's emergent. You can't know exactly what's going to happen because there are lots of moving parts. It's an organic, growing, flexible system. Um, and while information is useful, you also need perspective. You need multiple perspectives. Um, Andrew talked about the idea of learning curves being a, a potential barrier. And I think this is a good example of that is so many of the systems we have are built on uh, where you have to understand the way this system works. Uh, and, and that uh, uh, is, is trying to make complex systems into complicated ones and assuming that, oh, well, if, if you just know how to do it, you'll be able to achieve what you're trying to do, which doesn't always work. And one of the challenges in, uh, in, in responding to the climate emergency is it's a complex system that we often try and, and process using uh, systems or decision making tools that treat it as though it's complicated, which, which often miss the point. So I guess to put that in a bit of context, so here are three ways that we uh, in Cornwall Council communicate the climate emergencies. You're probably familiar with the climate stripes model, looking at the average temperature increases over time. This is another um, uh, graphic that we use uh, to communicate uh, why, we're, why we're aiming for 2030 uh, and trying to uh, avoid the 1.5 degree increase. Um, and then this is a graphic we use to talk about how, uh, how people can take action on a climate emergency and what people can do. And what you'll, you'll maybe notice with all of these is that they, they're, they're using the kind of the, the language of complication. Uh, the first one, you know, it's very kind of discrete bits of data. Second one is, is literally an equation. If, you, you, if this happens and it equals this and this and this. And then the third one is a little bit more complex because it's, it's more of a, about a kind of a system, but it's still, you know, here are some things. If we do all of these things, then we'll get to where we are. And this is important. We need to be able to communicate in ways that, that, that process complex issues. And so it's important that our communications are speaking about complication. But internally, we have to approach it differently. We have to, we have to hold the, the actual complexity of what's going on. Um, so this is the this is the governance system of, of Cornwall Council. You know, um, very similar to, uh, to, to to many local authorities. We've got four council. Uh, cabinet and, and scrutiny committees. So can, holding this idea of complexity, whether we're talking about um, the climate emergency, whether we're talking about COVID, whether we're talking about community wealth building, anything where it's, it's a complex system. Uh, and I think this, this graphic, I like it kind of represents uh, a bit of complexity. It's very hard to kind of get your head around. You have to look at, you know, pick little bits out of it. You can't really see how it all fits together. So the challenge is how do we how do we um, apply something like this to something like this? Uh, and the short answer is we, we can't. It's very difficult. Uh, you know, this system is not built to hold complexity, um, but there are things we can do about it. So this is um, this is a graphic that I use to, to to talk to people about how Cornwall Council is approaching carbon neutrality. Um, so. That's the work I do in, in the Carbon Neutral Cornwall team. And um, we're moving along this gray line from left to right and, uh, and getting concentrically closer and closer to carbon neutrality. So this is our journey for the next 10 years you know, or more of getting closer to carbon neutrality. But the key thing here is that carbon neutrality is not the outcome, it's not our end goal. It's just, a, it, it's an output. It's a mechanism by which we achieve the real goal, which is a just, thriving and resilient Cornwall. That's the point. There are many ways we could achieve carbon neutrality, but a lot of them would exacerbate inequality, leave a lot of people behind and not do the kind of, uh, um, uh, of, of building that we need uh, within our society. And again, thinking about complicated and complex, carbon neutrality is complicated. We can measure it to a degree. We can have a baseline. We can monitor it on an annual basis and see, you know, what are these numbers? How are we getting there? And that's important. That gives people a sense of progress and targets. But really, the complexity, we have to have that in mind. So we have to balance these things at the same time, which is difficult. But there are ways in which we can try and do that. Um, and so this is uh, what I'm going to um, talk in a bit more detail about. Um, so cabinet level, uh, so this, this part of our governance system, uh, since September uh, last year, every decision that, has, that goes through cabinet uses what we call the, the, the Cornwall Council decision wheel, which is based on 
the donor economics model. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the process of how that happens uh, and why that might be relevant. So these are the these are the um, the indicators that we will use. On the left hand side, we've got the, the um, planetary boundaries uh, on the outer ring, and then on the right, the inner ring. These are the the social indicators. So every decision. The officer that is bringing that will, will go through each of these and, and answer a series of questions. So here's an example of some of the questions. This isn't exhaustive. This is just a, a, a snapshot of, for instance, in food and air quality, the kind of questions that people are being asked. And you'll notice that they're all yes or no questions. So it's a quick to answer, but maybe not um, you have to know you have to know the you have to know the answer. So it, it flags up. Do you have enough information? It, do you know the answer to this question? Can you answer yes or no um, quickly? And if you can't, then what more information do you need to know? Because otherwise we can't make the best decision we possibly can because we don't have all of the information. So there's a process involved here. And then eventually uh, that, that question is scored or that, um, that, that area is scored from one to five using this, uh, this scoring system uh, to give it a color that's, that's easily recognizable which is then applied to the model. So this is an example of something that will, will come to cabinet um, and inform the decision about whether or not something goes forward. Uh, so this is a, an example from uh, Saints Trail, which is an active travel scheme uh, of, uh, of building new uh, pathways and cycleways uh, across Cornwall. So I think that there's, there's a few key things to take from this. So one is that there's a lot of gray there's a lot where we simply just don't know where they think there's probably not going to be an impact or we don't have that information. And that's a really important part of this is understanding within complexity. We're not going to know everything. And what can we do to better understand that? Uh, and then the other thing is looking at, OK, it's not all positive. And that's really important. When we first started using these, we, you know, we'd get something back that was just completely green. Um, and, uh, you know, I have to go back and say, we don't really believe you There's, you know you can't have a perfect answer in a comp to a complex question there's going to be a negative somewhere and if you haven't found it you haven't looked hard enough so one of the good things here is that it's been it's been suggested that actually in terms of land conversion biodiversity loss potentially crime there might be short-term negative impacts and so leaning into it and accepting that is a really important part of transparency and understanding well why are we doing this in the first place it's not just about economic growth it's not just about meeting one particular target of one particular part of the council this is relevant across everything uh, and it's learning that uh, kind of retraining the way we do things so we're not just making the same decisions again and again and again so some of the, the limitations of this um, it's not exhaustive um, so gender equality which was in uh, Kate Rayworth's initial model is not in um, uh, in, in this one, but it will be in the, se the, the, the second version that we're, we're doing now. And, and one example of why that is important is because there's a lot of re research that suggests that, that women are more, more likely to use public transport. So if we're looking at public transport and it's not, there's the, it's not good enough, there's the service is not there, that's not just about emissions, that's also about gender equality. The tool doesn't measure anything, it doesn't tell you what is happening and it doesn't tell you what would have happened otherwise. It's, it's, a, it's a proactive tool rather than a reactive one. Currently, there's no differentiation between the sections. So it might be that one area is, is much more significant than the other, but we have to judge that subjectively at the moment. Um, it is subjective. That's something that we need to approve, uh, improve over time. And it's only a tool, so it's only as good as the people that use it. But in terms of what's worked, it has made a complex uh, uh, system nuanced. It's made it accessible to the people who have to make decisions about it, which is crucial. It makes sure that those uh, gaps aren't ignored it improves the transparency in decision making. There's still a way to go on that. I think the appeal of innovation is really important to notice that, you know, people like, oh, we're the first ones to use this or, you know, we're the second or, or third or whatever. And after a while, it get, gets that momentum and then you think, well, why aren't you doing something like this? Similar to emergency declarations. Um, it does support decisions which might otherwise fail, um, but you could view that positively or negatively, I guess. Um, but it has really brought in tangible behaviour change in governance. It's a first step in that direction. It's not perfect by any me measure, um, but it is a first step. I think that's really helpful. And to, to engage with such a complex idea, um, this, is, this is crucial. So what we're doing now, uh, it, as I said, it's all, all cabinet decisions have been using this model. We're, we're doing a lot of training and developing of, of the systems and resources for, for staff to use it trialing it in different parts of the council, making it more understandable and more accessible to people and, and building new bits into the model. 
Um, and in the future, so version two hopefully is going to launch quite soon. Um, that's been delayed, but we're nearly there. It's going to be integrated with the existing um, decision making uh, tools that the council already uses. It will be self scoring, which will reduce the, the need for scrutiny from our team. It will accumulate and analyze that data. It will be on an app so that it's even easier for officers to use. Um, and it will be used beyond cabinet as well across the council more widely. Um, and, and, and ideally, there'll be a lot of co design in there. Um, and I think one of the key things is, is uh, with this, there's no right way to do it. This is the way we've adapted that, and I fully expect it to be very look very different in, in a year's time, in five years' time, in 10 years' time. It'll change, it'll iterate. Um, it's an incredibly useful way to, 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 to communicate and collaborate with others. Just this morning, we had a, a, an event um, with 60, 70 people from across Cornwall who are using this model in different ways and talking about, well, how can we share that? How can we learn from each other? And, and um, I know I haven't necessarily embedded this within community wealth building, but I hope you can see that the, the parallels in that is, it is really um, people and environment centric. And that's the thing, it's stepping back and look at the bigger picture and how all of these things interrelate. Because unless we have the mechanisms for decision makers to understand that complexity, I think we're doomed to just repeat the same mistakes we've always made. Um, so that's my 15 minutes uh, and I'll hand back over. Brilliant. Thank you, uh, Peter. A lot of that really resonates with um, some of the things that I'm thinking through with others at Mid-Devon uh, District Council. So thanks for that. Um, Ruth says, I love the decision making wheel. It's a really good way of showing how you can start to the donut economics theory into practice. Um, absolutely agree. Sometimes translating that, as you say, quite complex thinking and understanding into something practical and, and, and usable um, is the kind of missing link. So I, I think it's a brilliant tool. Um, so we've got a time now for some questions. I know that there's a few questions that people have already. So we'll do this as a kind of group Q and A session. Um, if there's if there's a kind of appetite to break into smaller groups to explore 